Decorative arts is an idea. Antiques, material culture, Americana, old stuff, what we call decorative arts has gone by various names over the years. Like all ideas and movements, it has an arc, a beginning, middle, and end. Things called decorative arts were of interest long before the term was in use. This is the video version of a program that traces the history of decor the decorative arts movement, which began after World War II, peaked in the 1970s and 80s, went into decline in the 1990s, and is now functionally of another time. It is time to rethink what we call, and how we do, work involving our American cultural material, material that remains relevant, interesting, and worth preserving. The decorative arts movement is rooted in antiquarianism, the instinct to preserve and protect local history. In historic places like Boston and Deerfield as early as the 1840s, counted among its early champions were literary figures like Henry David Thoreau, John Greenleaf Whittier, James Fenimore Cooper, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and dozens of lesser-known women writers working in what's called the local color genre. Women championed the cause of preservation, beginning, most famously, with the campaign to save George Washington's Mount Vernon by a national network known as the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, founded in the 1850s, almost 60 years before the founding of the National Park Service and almost 90 years before the National Trust. These and the lineage societies that followed not only gave birth to historic preservation in America, but invented the idea of the American House Museum. By 1876, a war-weary nation was ready to rekindle national pride with a new self-consciousness about history. For many Americans, this was the first time they saw what we now call antiques on display. It helped trigger the colonial revival. Founded in the 1890s, the DAR and colonial dames exploded on the scene, rounding up treasures, marking historic sites, publishing books and magazines, and saving some key structures. Then as now, patriotism, preservation, and education was their mission. Today, they own and care for about a hundred historic sites in almost every part of the nation. Shown here are DAR properties in Kingston, New York, and the John Adams Birthplace, now operated by the National Park Service in Quincy, Mass. Historic places are blessed with pioneering civic antiquarians who collected preserved, wrote, and advocated for local history, beginning before the Civil War, including John Fanning Watson of Philadelphia, George Sheldon of Deerfield, and Isaac Stewart of Hartford, and Henry David Thoreau of Concord, Mass. The 1870s brought a flurry of advice books catering to a growing middle class anxious to keep up with domestic fashions. Clarence Cook and Charles Eastlake were historicists looking to the past for artistic inspiration. In 1877, William C. Prime's Pottery and Porcelain of All Times and Nations was the first book on any aspect of what we now call American decorative arts, published in the U.S. He and his wife were among the renowned China hunters, based in Hartford and Worcester, Pottery collecting that involved knocking on farmhouse doors in search of antique treasures became a craze among affluent urbanites. This image from 1903 captures the mood of the time as antique shops, restorationists, and collecting took hold. In 1891, Dr. Irving Lyon from Hartford published the first book on American furniture. The words, decorative arts, never appears. It was still rooted in antiquarianism and a love of the local, though this, his scope was wide-ranging. The Walpole Society was founded in Boston in 1909. This was and is a private men's club of collectors and museum scholars. Its membership reads like a who's who of antiques collecting in the early 20th century. Included founders of such institutions as Winnetour, the American Wings at the Met and Brooklyn Museum, Historic Deerfield, and an influential Boston contingent. The Hudson Fulton exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1909 is widely regarded as a milestone and the point where our evolving art museums began to collect and display Americana, colonial art, antique furniture. They did not then call it decorative arts. The next year, a group of Bostonians led by William Sumner Appleton founded the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities for the purpose of preserving for posterity, places and objects of historical and other interests, and to preserve and illustrate the life of New Englanders. Now renamed Historic New England, the organization is rare. 
in combining preservation advocacy with the collecting and operating a, a chain of historic house museums. In 1924, the American Wing at the Metropolitan opened and became an immediate sensation. The next year, J.P. Morgan, Jr. acquired the famous Wallace Nutting Collection for Wadsworth, Athenaeum, and Hartford. Its opening attracted the largest public audience in the Athenaeum's history up to that point. Collector Luke Vincent Lockwood, whose 1901 Colonial Furniture in America was one of the first book-length treatments of the subject, helped kickstart an American wing at the Brooklyn Museum, complete with a suite of period rooms, a diorama-like display technique popular at the time. Edwin Attlee Barber, a ceramics expert who became director of the Pennsylvania Museum before it was renamed the Philadelphia Museum of Art, was a Walpolean and champion of Americana and the colonial arts. In 1929, the biggest event in the movement without a name was the Girl Scouts Loan Exhibition in New York. It was the first time Henry DuPont stepped out as a lender. The movement was beginning to codify around a connoisseurship that recognized place, period, and craftsmanship. Wallace Nutting was the most influential antiques world thought leader in the 1920s, publishing multiple books on aspects of antiques and historic places, creating and marketing staged photos of colonial interiors, and placing his collection uh, with Hartford's Wadsworth Athenaeum. Henry Sleeper was another influencer. His Gloucester estate, Beauport, modeled a stylized approach to living with antiques that influenced Henry DuPont and a generation of tastemakers. Henry Francis DuPont began serious collecting in 1929 and by 1951 was ready to open his winter tour estate in Delaware to the public as a museum, the scale and likes of which the world had never seen, with 200 period rooms, a mountain of painstaking leave presented antiques. Winnetour was a midwife to the idea of decorative arts and launched the first graduate training program in, for museum workers interested in early American. In 1930, Francis Garvin donated a massive collection of furniture and silver to the art gallery at Yale, where courses on pots and pans and a graduate program spawned generations of museum practitioners. The Great Depression interrupted, though did not quash, the antiques craze of the 1920s. President Roosevelt's Work Progress Administration launched several programs that blew wind into the sales of the movement. The Federal Arts Project and the Index of America, American Design paid artists to document, illustrate, and promote interest in Americana that we now call decorative arts. Then came the Second World War, deepening the horror and savagery of the 20th century. No cages were left unrattled. With the war finally over, and as a new Cold War began with the Soviet Union and China, Americans found refuge in heightened patriotism rooted in the past. The next 30 years would be a golden age for historic preservation, American art, and what we is, was now increasingly called American decorative arts, as the champions of antiques in Americana deepened their inroads and presence in American museums. Evidence became overwhelming in the 50s and 60s that Americana and traditional craft had moved to the center of popular culture. Having limped through the Depression, Antiques Magazine rebounded in the 50s through 70s with theme issues at the then-new Outdoor Living History Museums in Cooperstown and Sturbridge, Mass. Preservation organizations, mostly founded by women, took off and reshaped the horizons of places like Savannah, Charleston, Philadelphia, and Annapolis. The National Trust was founded in 1948, and by 1966, preservation values were enshrined in law with the National Register up and running. Antiques Magazine's staff editor, Barbara Snow, brought a historic preservation focus. The magazine, more than any other in the 50s and 60s, became the diary of the movement. Before and after, pictures of historic districts in places like Annapolis shown here excited planners, architects, urbanists, and architectural historians. The movement was truly on fire. Back with antique furniture, a new connoisseurship built around the rallying call of An Albert Sachs' famous Good, Better, and Best armed collectors and museums with information and aspiration. Furniture historian John Kirk brought furniture study to a larger public audience, and dealer F Roger Bacon trained a generation to appreciate untouched condition in old paint. 
This was the age when iconic institutions were formed by ambitious, civic-minded collectors like the Flints, who founded historic Deerfield, and Ima Hogg's Bayou Bend in Houston. The Winter Antique Show in New York was founded in 1953. The Connecticut Antique Show in 1955. Tastemakers like Nina Little in Boston carved out a niche in folk art, portraits by rural artists and painted walls and colorful textiles. Lillian Cogan, Mary Alice, and Catherine Prentice Murphy, three Connecticut-based antique dealers, showed young couples how to live with antiques in old houses they bought and restored. Then the bomb dropped when First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy transformed the White House into a house museum in 1961. It was the biggest news story in the history of this movement. Her televised tour of the White House in 1962 reached a gigantic audience. It's like she was channeling went to her guides, even as she'd never, even if she'd never actually met one. It was a museological approach that put provenance and authenticity first. Henry DuPont's Winter Tour Museum had opened to the public in 1951. It inspired Mrs. Kennedy, who invited DuPont to join the White House Advisory Committee while his director and resident scholar Charles Montgomery was setting the gold standard for furniture scholarship. In Boston, Abbott Lowell Cummings mentored a rising generation of scholars and blazed a trail with his studies of estate inventories, textiles, and architecture. The restoration and refurnishing of SPNEA's Harrison Gray Otis House was a model of scientific antiquarianism, using inventories and various documentation to create fact-based restorations. Decorative art studies were maturing rapidly. The field crackled with energy, blazing trails into new areas of studies like folk art, Long disparaged by tastemakers, the 19th century came into focus during the 1970s, culminating in a full-on Victorian revival. In Hartford, the Mark Twain House became a model of scholarly restoration. The Crawford Collection at the High Museum in Atlanta became one of the first art museums to focus on Victorian decorative arts. The Margaret Woodbury Strong Museum in Rochester, dubbed the Winter Tour of the 19th Century, became the epicenter of 19th century material culture studies. Rural furniture and craft, largely overlooked by the first generation, turned work and rural vernacular in Robert Trent's famous Heart and Hearts and Crowns exhibition from 1977. American furniture from New France. Deep dives into periods like the 17th century and MFA Boston's 1982 New England Begins and the, the Rococo of the 1850s and 70s at the Met. By 1980, American decorative arts was the biggest thing going on in American art museums and not just in the East. The Milwaukee Art Center and the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee raised the bar through exhibitory publication and education. The Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts in North Carolina put the arts of the Old South on display with a path-breaking survey program, publications, and summer institute. Bigger and more influential than ever, Antiques Magazine did theme issues on the decorative arts and architecture of various states. More theme issues on major institutions like SPNEA and Wittator and their famous May Furniture issue, which to date has published several hundred articles on American furniture history. Endless conferences, symposia, and workshops. By the 1980s, most house museums you'd visit slanted their interpretation towards decorative arts and antiques uh, education. The market was hot with rare objects crossing the million dollar mark and collectors like the flamboyant Eddie Nicholson whooping it up in the New York auctions. It couldn't last and didn't. No one, one event, no one event signaled the gradual collapse of the bubble and decline in the market and in public interest. Did it start to trend down in the mid 90s? By 2010, there was despair among dealers and some collectors who bought at the height of the frenzy and would never get back what they paid. Legendary dealerships like Israel Sack, John Walton, and Lee Kino either folded up their tents or diversified into other things. Where does that leave it? The culture will always change. Every generation or two, there is a need to find new ways to talk about old things. 
The stuff is engaging to the degree it resonates with contemporary human concerns. Many local me museums are actually doing more business and have more civic engagement than ever. Maybe this is a back to the future moment, a time to revisit where all this started in the first place. The founding antiquarians were all about love local and their particular places of the heart. They collected to document the heritage of places they loved. Today, the placemaking and lo love local are movements on the rise. Where does history and old stuff fit in? Potentially everywhere. To what contemporary human concerns might the cultural material of the past speak? It's interesting that globalization is finally in the crosshairs. We know it swept away the makers' economies of the past. Globalization breeds homogenization, whereas human societies are fundamentally tribal and crave place markers and a rich, distinctive sense of place, past, and community. There is a deep need for civic attachment, and that starts at the local level. The Love Local movement is on fire with locally grown foods, farmers markets, local art, local beer, and even place-based education finding growing public support. Places are doubling down on their treasures and finding ways to program, promote, and engage people with local stuff and stories. Heritage tourism continues to grow as millions of affluent, educated baby boomers retire, travel, and seek authentic experiences in places worth caring about. And as young people reshape places with an eye to keeping it real and authentic. Alas, ongoing culture wars since the 1960s and other factors have decimated the humanities in colleges and universities. Where that's headed is hard to see, say, but we now have the lowest levels of historical literacy in generations. And while triumphalism, boosterism, and national narratives about government wars and dead white males needed reform, who can deny that the pendulum is way out there today? It's an issue. It's hard to expect young people whose education in civics and history was stunted to grow up passionate about our nation's heritage. Does that matter? How could it not? Don't we need to put the unum back in e pluribus unum? Many yearn for heartfelt attachment to things bigger than ourselves, a way to get from me to we, a sense of gratitude and reverence. I am Bill Hosley, and I believe in the stuff and stories that make us a nation worth caring about. I believe object knowledge is indispensable to museum practice and civic life. It's a whole language unto itself that takes us to aspects of history reached no other way. Knowing my way around old stuff has been a blessing. The learning and discovery never stops. It's time to grapple with the question of what's next for things formerly known as decorative arts.